it's the weirdest crossover that nobody asked for. Again, Justice League X Ruby, Superheroes and Huntsmen Part 2. Now these two crossover movies are really unique in that each part takes place in one of the brand's homeworlds, or at least a version of it. Being that Part 1 is more Ruby-centric, Part 2 is all about the Justice League. So by all means, that means that this half of the movie should appeal to me, right? Well, I guess we're gonna find out. The second part picks up right where the first one left off. Seeing our heroes wake up in their own reality, and be back to something more familiar to both them and me. The characters now feel much more to form, with a lot of famous voice actors reprising their roles, bringing back Travis Willingham to play Superman, just as he's done in the LEGO DC films and games, as well as in the Battle of the Super Sons. Likewise, Laura Bailey returns to the role of Wonder Woman, whom she played previously in those same LEGO DC games, and Troy Baker plays Batman, just as he's done in another Batman-related crossover and the Telltale series. He's also played the Joker, Two-Face, Nightwing, Robin, and just about everyone else under the Bat banner that you can think of. The part of the Flash will also now be played by David Dismalchin, who he himself has played just about everyone under the DC banner at this point. Seriously, if there was ever a DC Hall of Fame made, he and John Glover would be the first inductees into the actor's wing. Now, in some cases, this voice acting is a godsend, because I really didn't want to live in a world where the kid from the Naked Brothers Band actually plays Batman. I already had to learn how to not hate the Twilight guy. This, this would just be a step too far. In spite of this, not every character is recast, as Cyborg, Green Lantern, Vixen, and Kilgore all maintain their voice actors from the first part, while Jamie Chung plays this universe's Black Canary. Some other DC heroes are also present, but not present. Green Arrow and the Titans are said to be stopping this otherworldly threat elsewhere. And we even get a quick shot of Shazam. There's some new villains added to the mix here as well. Joker and Harley make a cameo, Weather Wizard and Mirror Master show up, and even Catwoman and the Riddler get a mention. But the most noteworthy of the rogues gallery has to be Killer Croc. Just for the simple fact that he's being played by former AEW World Champion MJF which feels like a strange choice at face value. Like, he's clearly a talented dude, but this part just doesn't seem up his alley. Now, if you were casting Johnny Cage in a Mortal Kombat movie, uh, to me, this would be more than understandable. They might as well give me the belt right now. But they do have belts, right? But Maxwell Jacob Friedman as Killer Croc? I, I, I fail to see the correlation. Although, I guess Killer Croc was a wrestler, so there, there was that. Uh, that being said, not particularly bad. Though the villains aren't all that villainous here, as the Grimm serve as a threat to all humanity. There's no good guys and bad guys in this fight, uh, just guys and potential victims. Well, that is, except for the guys who are controlling the Grimm. While the two teams may have defeated Kilgore in virtual reality, he proves that he's still an ever-present threat here in reality, though he's not working alone. Which would be clear even if he hadn't revealed that himself considering the entire team laugh him off as an ineffective B-list buffoon. It's obvious to the team that Kilgore isn't capable of running this operation all by himself. He's clearly in cahoots with someone from Remnant. Realizing that they too now know someone's from Remnant, they reach out via interdimensional text message to ask for the aid of Team Ruby. The team obliges and crosses over into the world of DC. It's interesting seeing the characters of Ruby brought into this reality and given dimension-appropriate makeovers, but I don't even know how accurate that is to say. These character appearances are definitely altered, but the thing is, I wouldn't even say that they're changed to better suit their environment. Every character still looks completely out of place in this universe, maybe with the one exception of Belladonna, who just sort of blends in, but just barely. She could maybe pass for this universe's huntress if I didn't know any better. But even in saying that, I'm confused by the decision to make her human in this world. Because metahumans are a thing here. The cat ears wouldn't have been unacceptable, is all I'm saying. The movie makes it a point to show you a giant killer crocodile man. Once again, I enjoy this animation style, but even when we're in the DC Universe, it still feels like the DC Universe through a ruby lens. In terms of story, I don't think there's much of one to tell. Kilgore and his unseen partner are manipulating the Grimm in unnatural ways, causing them to quickly evolve and learn from defeat, regenerating at a rapid speed following a loss, and returning with an immunity to whatever it was that destroyed it previously, growing stronger and stronger with each generation, and adapting from its opponents specifically. 
At one point, one even grows a kryptonite heart to stop Superman. This sort of threat is creative, and it forces both Team Ruby and the Justice League to think on their feet, as they attempt to outsmart learning artificial intelligence. But ultimately, like I said about the first part, the plot only exists just to set up a reason for these two worlds to collide, and for very unique battle sequences to take place. Visually, I kinda love what this offers up, but it feels like that's the only thing it has to offer. Still, that's not to say it's awful. The fight scenes are fun and constantly creative. They're highly entertaining and serves the real highlight of both parts. But past these pleasing aesthetics, this thing's covered in blemishes. In terms of depth, I would say it's pretty shallow, though those are the better aspects of the movie. When it's style over substance, I would say it succeeds. But when it's attempting to dig deeper than the surface, it just feels off. It never really finds itself. After having been made a vessel to kill Gore, the Flash is left feeling powerless, paranoid, and petrified of falling victim to his mind manipulation again. Batman is sidelined after being poisoned. Ruby has become uncharacteristically reckless, acting as if she has some sort of death wish. There's actually a moment where it looks like she's severely injured, and for as important as all of this sounds, it's almost like none of it really matters. These moments are underplayed and given so little attention that they might as well not exist. Some of these seemingly serious scenarios play out within a scene or two, some of which come to fruition in the climax, but all of which fall flat. The dialogue in this movie feels really goofy. I don't know if that's a product of Ruby. I don't know what the tone of that show is. I imagine it's somewhat similar to what's seen here but it especially feels out of place when we're in the Justice League's universe. You'd think we'd get a product more reminiscent of DC in this one. The movie is good for what it is, but I just don't think I'm ultimately a big fan of what it is. It also doesn't help matters that I'm not a fan or even slightly familiar with one half of the two collaborating brands here. Half the story goes over my head because even when these movies are explaining themselves, they can't really convey the weight of a moment properly. Like when it's revealed that Kilgore's partner is actually Watts, that means nothing to me. I get that they said it and they showed it in a millisecond cutaway, but I know next to nothing about his character. And granted, you could probably say it's because I don't know much about the series, but I'd argue that a good crossover takes its time to properly portray both sides crossing over. You want to create new fans of your brand by introducing that brand to a potential new audience. It's worked before! It's worked before on me. It's how I got into Final Fantasy. I mean, I know that he's a madman who tried to recreate the world in his image and destroyed Weiss's homeworld, but I, I don't know who he is. Though to be fair, that's actually much more of an explanation that Ruby fans got for who Kilgore is. The team of Kilgore and Watts lured Justice League Ruby Edition to a virtual reality, where there they have the home field advantage. As Kilgore continues to take over members of both hero teams, while at the same time Cyborg's trying to manipulate the giant virtual Grimm that he plugged into, so really, uh, this whole ending is just a chaotic mess. Ultimately, the two teams manage to play their foes against one another by appealing to their shared narcissistic need to be seen as superior and smart, forever trapping them in a shared simulation where the two will presumably fight until the end of time. And that is Justice League X Ruby. And if I'm being honest with you, even after watching both of them, multiple times, I'm still not entirely sure what they are. Maybe it's because I just don't have any real desire to know about the Ruby brand. I mean, that that's certainly a possibility. But for me personally, I think it's that I fail to see the synergy between these two brands. This two-parter feels like an incredibly unnatural crossover. And that would be fine if they were playing more into that. But as it stands, these movies were made to be taken at face value. It's not an absurd collaboration for the sake of absurdity. It's an absurd pairing of two established entities that just is. I don't hate it, I don't really think it's terrible enough to hate, but ultimately I just don't feel like it makes all that much of an impression. I may have enjoyed part two a little bit more than I enjoyed part one, but that's just because it more closely resembles what it is I'm a fan of. Part one definitely has a much better story, well, whatever story there is. All in all, Justice League and Ruby? Uh, not for me. Not the best crossover the brand has ever seen. But if you like this video and would like to see me talk about another Batman-related crossover, one that sees the Dark Knight meet the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, What is this? A crossover episode? I am vengeance.
I am the knight, and that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.